uh, RSE School Seminar this week. Uh, an acknowledgement of country. We are meeting on the lands of the Ngunnawal people, so I'd like to pay our respects to elders past and present. Um, today we have the presentation from Joe Brown and David Hutchinson will be introducing Joe. Um, I'd just like to go through a couple of highlights of what's happened recently. So Hiravoye has been given an honorary doctorate from his alma mater, the University of Zagreb, for his contributions to the natural sciences and seismology. Congratulations, Hiravoye. I don't think he's here. Can't see him. Can't see anything, actually, with the light back there. Um, Callum Shakespeare has had a large paper published or accepted recently. Apparently, there were 38 co-authors, which must have been an absolute nightmare. So congratulations, Caleb. And um, Ching Chang and Laura Otter have received travel grants from the DVCR's office to attend the conference in Wuhan in September. So congratulations. I can see Laura sitting there. I can't see Ching Chang. Okay, so there are a couple of things that have happened in RSES recently. And I'll just repeat what I said at the, at the staff meeting. When we have those staff meetings, we area heads go down into our areas and ask for people to contribute things. And we rarely get significant information coming back up. So if something happens that you think might be interesting to the school, blow your own trumpet and tell your area heads so that we can promote this sort of stuff and put it in the newsletters. It's always good for people to know what's going on in the school. So I'll hand over to David to introduce the speaker, Joe. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So yeah, today I've got Josephine Brown from University of Melbourne. She's a senior lecturer in the School of Geography in Earth and Atmospheric Science. Uh, jo has a background in physics and in fact did her honours year at ANU in astronomy, I think in the heyday of being at Mount Stromlo. Um, did then PhD at University of Melbourne uh, and then postdocs in Reading and Melbourne again, I think, or Monash, Monash sorry, yeah, Monash. Um, then from, Joe was at the Bureau from 2009 to 2019 before starting a position at Melbourne in paleoclimate modelling. So Joe's interested in past and future. Uh, tropical circulation has been a big theme for research. Um, and is there anything else? I think that's, that's it. So take it away, Joe. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks very much, David and John. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak to you here and to visit this uh, beautiful campus in this lovely sunny winter weather. Um, so I just wanted to start by um, sort of acknowledging um, the input from a range of uh, students, current students and past students, uh, colleagues and uh, collaborators and also the um, the collects uh, computational modeling team as well, who are um, incredibly valuable in assisting us to actually carry out these paleoclimate modeling simulations. Um, so just a bit of motivation for this work. Um, obviously we're interested in studying past climates for their own sakes, because it's fascinating to understand the history of our climate. Um, but we also can use studying the past to help us better understand um, the climate system in general and in particular, some of the areas that we have a lot of uncertainty in our future climate projections. And so for Australia, we have a lot of different components of the climate system that influ influence us um, in the present day. And we don't really know how some of those are gonna change in the future. So the monsoon is one um, that I've worked on a lot. And also um, El Nino Southern Oscillation is another one. And so they're really important drivers of our climate, our climate variability and extremes, but we don't really have a good grip on how they may change in the future. And so the past can hopefully contribute to um, telling us something about the sensitivity of the system and also um, potentially evaluating our climate models as well. And in terms of our wider region, uh, this is something that I've worked on a bit when I was at the Bureau. I was actually doing um, work on future projections for, for the Pacific region. And again, we had um, some things that we had a lot of confidence in, but others that were quite uncertain. Uh, and particularly this, this very distinctive band of rainfall, the South Pacific Convergence Zone, which is um, not that well studied, but is very, very important for uh, a lot of the South Pacific islands and communities there. 
it has an impact on um, the region of tropical cyclone formation and also brings the, the rainfall um, to, to those islands. And so, again, there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of how that may change in the future. And so that's another motivator to look to the past to try and better understand this part of our regional climate. So just a bit of an overview, um, I'm going to start with a few words about what is paleoclimate modelling. I think about half the people in this room probably know very well, but I just want to make sure that um, everyone sort of understands what we're doing and then talk about um, two of the main experiments which are run as part of our big international paleoclimate modelling effort um, and then talk about how we can make use of those and some other tools to look at some aspects of the, of the climate. So ENSO, the Australian monsoon uh, and the South Pacific Convergence Zone being the ones that I've sort of focused on most in my research. And then just a brief comment at the end about some possible future directions. So again, apologies for those of you that know um, a great deal about this, but um, paleoclimate modeling is actually using the same climate models that are used for our future climate projections so we talk about um, these coupled models, coupled atmosphere and ocean models, and there's big international projects to run those models to look at the future, the coupled model into comparison projects, phase five and phase six in particular. So um, these models are usually developed and evaluated for the present day climate. That's when we have all of our instrumental measurements that we can test them against. Um, but we can actually use the same code, the same climate models to simulate a range of past climates, provided that we have the forcings or the inputs or the boundary conditions um, to, to run them. And of course, that's not a trivial matter to do that. Um, so fundamentally, we're trying to represent the physics and the, the important processes in the climate system. So these are schematic of things like um, the ocean circulation, the atmosphere, the cryosphere, the land surface, the atmospheric chemistry, um, convection, et cetera. And all of those processes are represented by a set of equations which are solved um, on a grid, which has a particular latitude and longitude spacing, um, as well as having a number of vertical layers through the atmosphere and the ocean. And so um, as we want to get to smaller and smaller scales, we have more and more of these, which of course takes more and more computing resources. And so that's always the trade-off in, in our, our climate modelling um, and particularly in paleoclimate modelling when we often want to run long experiments as well. We have to kind of trade off resolution and other things. Uh, and then when it comes to actually running these codes, of course, we make use of supercomputers like Guardia NCI um, to, to actually run our simulations of past climates. So that is what I'm talking about um, when I talk about paleoclimate modelling. And there's this big international effort, the Paleoclimate Modelling Intercomparison Project, or PMIT. We love uh, acronyms. And so that has a set of key experiments which a lot of the modelling groups around the world are encouraged to run. And the reason why we want to do that, in the early days, paleoclimate modelling, um, every modelling group just kind of set up their own experiments and ran it however they thought was best. And it was very hard to compare because one group used one sort of, you know, greenhouse gas forcing and another group used a different ice sheet and it just wasn't, it wasn't easy to compare the output. So now we have these standard experiments that all the modelling groups try to run and we can much more easily compare them. Um, they're also linked into the future projections efforts of that CMIP. Um, so the latest one of PMIT, the paleoclimate modelling, was um, number four, and that was sort of linked in with various reasons, the numberings out of phase, but the, the coupled modelling for the future was, was up to phase six. And so the same climate models were being run for the past and for the future, which allows us to do some quite nice things in terms of comparing responses in the climate system in the past versus in the future. Anyway, so the key experiments that all the groups try to do are this mid-Holocene and last spatial maximum experiments. Um, well, one or the other of those they have to do to sort of be part of PMIP. Um, and I'll talk most about those two. So uh, there's also the last millennium, which is, uh, as you can imagine, the simulation of a thousand years of climate, um, which has been done actually here at, at ANU with, with Narely and, and Nikki. And the last interglacial um, around 127,000 years ago is also one of the experiments. And there's a fair bit of interest these days in running 
um, the mid Pliocene experiments back around 3.3 million years ago, where we're looking at CO2 levels that are kind of similar to where we may be today or in the near future. So those are the main, um, the main sort of core experiments. And then there are some others um, looking at sort of the deglaciation and also these deep MIP experiments going further back in time, things like the Eocene, um, the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum, and some of the work that David's been doing with the Miocene as well, part of that, those efforts to go back further in time. So uh, I just wanted to mention as well that there are kind of two different ways that we can do paleoclimate modelling. Um, we can either set up an experiment with um, continue, or constant boundary conditions that is basically a time slice of a particular past climate. So it could be the mid Holocene 6,000 years ago, or it could be the last glacial maximum 21,000 years ago. And we're trying to get a representative sample of that past climate um, by putting in sort of fixed boundary conditions for that time period. And most of the PMIP experiments are actually in that sort of time slice format. Um, but there's also another way of running a model where you actually try and have the climate evolving through time, a transient simulation. And so we could run, for example, a transient simulation of the Holocene um, the last 11 and a half thousand years, um, or we could run a transient simulation right through that period from the cold um, glacial into the warm interglacial climate. Um, but that would that would need us to have time varying uh, inputs, and it would also, in the case here of it, um, so glacial to interglacial would need us to represent the changes in ice sheets and things. So those runs are more challenging to set up and also require um, more computing resources because you're talking about running the model for several thousand years or more. And so um, a lot of the paleo data community have records like speleotherms or ice cores. Um, uh, probably lake records, things like that, will come to us and say, you know, I want a simulation that runs through um, the last 100,000 years, for example, or the last, you know, glacial cycle. Um, and it, it would be really great if we could provide that, but it's actually very challenging from a computing point of view. So um, it's, it's the goal, but for now, a lot of what we have is actually these time slice simulations or um, transient runs from very simple, simplified models. So just to introduce the two main PMIP experiments that I'm going to be um, talking about today. Firstly, the mid Holocene 6,000 years before present is um, a climate which is not that different from the present day. And so when we run those experiments, we can keep quite a few things at the same um, setting as we would if we were running pre-industrial. When we say pre-industrial, we're talking about sort of 1850 or so before we have to take into account um, you know, human changes in the climate system. So uh, we've got the most important uh, four things we put in are these greenhouse gas changes, which are derived from ice core information. And the changes in the orbital parameters for the mid Holocene are really important because there's a change in the timing of perihelion um, rel relative to our the equinoxes and solstices, and that means there's a change in the seasonality of insulation, which has a big impact on our climate, as we'll find out. Um, so some of the motivation for the community to go to the trouble of actually focusing on this mid-Holocene period, um, it, you could actually get a larger orbital change if you went back a bit further to the early Holocene, but then you would have to deal with the fact that sea level was, was at a different um, level and things like that, the, the residual ice sheets coming out of the last ice age. So the compromise is this 6,000 years ago where we still have quite a big change in the orbital settings. Uh, it gives us this, um, this is a, the latitude on, uh, on the y-axis and the month on the bottom here. So you can sort of see the change in insulation from um, each month which latitude with an increase in um, the middle of the year in the northern hemisphere summer and a reduction in insulation in uh, southern hemisphere summer. And so those changes have big impacts on things like the monsoons, which are really sensitive to seasonal cycle of heating. Um, we can look at how uh, that responds, the monsoons respond. We can also look at things like ENSO. We have quite a lot of detailed paleoclimate records from this period that we can actually compare our models to. So that's probably the main um, motivations for these kind of mid-Holocene simulations. Uh, and I'll just give a kind of a preview on the global scale of the kind of uh, what 
what the climate looks like in our climate models. So we have 16 different models that have done this uh, experiment at the time when we, when we were doing the analysis. Um, and we can just take an average across all of those models and see how the climate changes compared to that pre-industrial baseline. And so we can see it's important for the mid Holocene to look at the seasons rather than the annual average because there's a lot more um, change at the seasonal timescale. And we can see the response to those changes in the incoming solar radiation are the large scale cooling in DJF, December, January, February, uh, particularly in over land areas and uh, warming in June, July, August, particularly uh, sort of in the, the high latitudes and land in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, then we can see sort of large scale rainfall responses to those changes. For example, uh, first let's start with the Northern Hemisphere summer. We can see the strengthening of both the uh, West African monsoon here and the Asian monsoon, uh, which is consistent with a lot of paleo records at the time, showing that those were quite a lot stronger in the early to mid Holocene. Um, I didn't mention before, but there's, there's a whole kind of study around, for example, the Green Sahara at that time. So models are showing that kind of response. And then in the Southern Hemisphere, we see um, an overall drying in our summer across most land areas, although it's wetter in some ocean areas. Um, and some, some of our monsoon regions also look drier when we, when we look at the, the sort of global picture like this. But we'll zoom in to the Australian region in a moment. Uh, I firstly just want to also introduce the other time period, though, which is the last glacial maximum. And this one is um, taking the model, I guess, a bit further out of its comfort zone, if you like, into a climate which is quite different from the present day. So now we have these massive ice sheets described in the model as um, a change in the land surface, obviously, and the elevation, because they're several, several kilometres high over, um, over North America in particular. So there's a couple of different reconstructions that the uh, modeling community selects there. And we also have to alter um, the sea level to, to accommodate that change in ice volume. And so you can see the changes in the land, uh, the continental sort of outlines there. Uh, for example, Australia's joined to New Guinea and uh, Sahul in the north. And there are a number of sort of ocean gateways that are um, closed at that time as well that we need to take into account. Um, so we have modified greenhouse gas concentrations, uh, lower CO2 at that time, about 190, which is another driver of the, of the global cooling at that time. And we put all that into the model. And in this case, we have to run our models for quite a while for them to actually adjust because it's such a dramatic change in the climate from our, our present day. So we have to run them for a few thousand years until they stabilize and hopefully um, reach some kind of stable, cold, kind of cold ice age climate. Um, and the motivation for these kind of last glacial maximum experiments are to understand how the global climate changes with these massive ice sheets, um, lower, lower CO2, and it's often used to evaluate um, climate sensitivity, which is that sort of fundamental variable that determines, that measures how much uh, temperature changes with a given change in CO2, because we have a pretty good handle on the global temperature change at that time. Um, and we look at whether the models can do a good job at matching the patterns of temperature and rainfall change uh, in the glacial period uh, relative to proxies. So I'm interested in, in our region, and I'll come back and look at how uh, some of the climate um, variables change in our region under this very cold glacial climate. And in this case, we don't have quite as many of the newest generation models to, to look at because uh, it's quite a hard simulation to actually run. And uh, only I think around half a dozen or so modeling groups have actually run it in the latest group and some from the previous generation. So we took what was available. Uh, we ended up with 12 models that had run this and we uh, take the average again of all those climate models. You can see here, um, the large scale pattern of change relative to pre-industrial is again uh, cooling particularly strong over those ice sheets and over land areas. Um, and if we look at the rainfall change, it's so the little stippling here is showing where there's relatively uh, poor model agreement, but in the regions where there's no stippling, we can see it's mostly drying, which is consistent with what you would expect with a globally cooler climate. Um, but there are also some shifts in things like uh, the tropical rainfall bands as well. You can see some 
changes in the, the tropical conversion zones uh, in that, that cold glacial climate. So we'll come back and have a look at those in a bit more detail. So now I wanted to look at a couple of um, case studies of what we can learn from this kind of paleo climate modeling work. So El Nino Southern Oscillation, of course, doesn't need any introduction. Uh, it's it's the, the major driver of climate variability from year to year in our part of the world and brings these very large um, changes in rainfall with very dry conditions, for example, along eastern Australia during El Nino in, in uh, winter and spring. But when we look at um, climate model projections of ENSO in the future, we, we find that there's still quite a lot of disagreement. So just a paper looking at um, the change in the strength of ENSO in a bunch of different climate models here. Um, and they find that some models are showing that ENSO will become stronger and others are showing that it will become weaker in a future warmer climate. So that's uh, still quite frustrating that we don't have more certainty about that. And we want to look at past climates to see whether we can better understand how ENSO changes when the mean climate changes. Um, we also want to test our models where we have information about past changes in ENSO to see whether they can actually capture those changes as well and whether we have any confidence in, in sort of how sensitive they are to different kinds of climate forcings. So there's a lot of attempts to reconstruct ENSO from different kinds of paleoclimate archives. And in particular for the mid Holocene, a lot of that comes from fossil corals. So um, Marilee's group's been involved in that as well. Um, trying to find places where, where corals are preserved that have that strong uh, isotopic sensitivity to El Nino Southern Oscillation, both in terms of temperature and rainfall variability. And so a couple of um, studies I've just picked out here, one from um, Sandy Tide Hopes group where they were looking at corals from uh, the coast of New Guinea, which go back actually a long way in time, but in particular, they have a bunch of corals that were growing during the Holocene. And the isotopic, the delta values are reflecting changes in temperature and rainfall due to ENSO. And so the amplitude of that variance is basically the strength of ENSO um, in, the, in the modern coral here. And we can compare that with a coral growing, say, six and a half thousand years ago. And we find that uh, it's around 60% weaker than modern at that time. Um, and then uh, Helen McGregor's work, uh, I think it's Christmas Island, but she has quite a long record from around four and a half thousand years ago that also shows a really large weakening of that interannual kind of ENSO driven vari variability in, um, in the early, sorry, in the mid, mid to late Holocene. And then um, there are quite a number of others. We go into the details of those, but it's, it's a bit outside of um, the scope of this talk. But we do have some consensus of a weaker ENSO uh, in the early to mid Holocene. When we go back further in time to the last glacial maximum, it's a lot more uncertain. There are some records showing stronger ENSO, um, some showing weaker ENSO, and it probably depends on which aspect of, of ENSO they're actually sensitive to. Uh, we really don't have a, a clear picture at, of whether um, during the ice age, whether ENSO was stronger or weaker. If we go all the way back to the last interglacial, um, there does seem, from, from the very limited uh, records available, there does also seem to be evidence of weaker ENSO. So again, with Sandy's work from uh, Papua New Guinea, he has one um, very, very old fossil coral from that time period, which does again show quite weak interannual variability. So a suggestion anyway, that there may have been weak, weaker than present or weak, weaker than modern ENSO during the last interglacial. So in the modeling work, um, we make use of all of the available simulations from uh, each of those experiments, the last glacial maximum, the mid Holocene, and the last interglacial, and also um, some of the future or sort of idealized future runs from the same climate models. So, climate modeling groups ran an experiment where they in increased our CO2 uh, by 1% per year, and another one where they increased it very abruptly to four times. Um, the modern level. And so you can sort of use those as an idealized future warmer um, scenario. So we put all of those together into a big um, data set to try and look at any kind of common patterns and see how ENSO changes in the past versus the future. 
Um, just firstly, to look at how the mean state changes. So looking at the sea surface temperatures across the, the tropics and the Pacific. Um, the mid Holocene up the top here, the last glacial maximum, the last interglacial, and then these are the two um, idealized future runs. And you can see that there's some, uh, not surprisingly, the strong cooling in the, in the LGM, the last glacial maximum, and warming in these runs. But there's also some regional um, changes in temperatures, for example, this sort of key ENSO region um, seems to be cooler in, in those uh, mid Holocene and last interglacial runs. And in the future runs, there's quite an enhanced warming across the tropical Pacific, which may have an impact on ENSO strength. So we measure the change in, in El Nino Southern Oscillation just by looking at the sea surface temperatures in this box, um, right in the middle of the equatorial Pacific, where sort of the largest variations occur when we have El Nino and La Nina events, the Nino 3.4 region. So we look at how the sea surface temperatures change in that region uh, and just measure the variance of that as a, a simple metric of, um, of ENSO strength. And I'm sure you can't see the details here, but we try and look at that for each model in Holocene, LGM, et cetera. And so just to kind of pull out the key points here, most of the models actually agree that the uh, strength of ENSO was, was reduced by somewhere between five and 10% during the mid-Holocene. Not every single model. Uh, I haven't got access to ESM on there because the run wasn't completed in time for this paper, but it's actually one of the, the renegade models that has a slightly um, stronger ENSO but the majority of the models actually do have that weakening in the mid-Holocene, which is consistent with the paleo evidence. Uh, in the last interglacial, even stronger consensus, we don't, again, unfortunately, access the SM's not here, but the models that are um, showing that sort of strong reduction in ENSO, even more like 20 to 30% reduction in some cases. So it's a response to the change in seasonality of insulation that ENSO is really, really weakened. But when we come to the last basal maximum, it's quite, um, it's quite a disagreement. Some models have stronger and some have weaker. And similarly in our idealized future cases. So it seems like a sort of large scale warming or cooling, um, it, it, it really varies from model to model. Whereas when we have this perturbation of the seasonal heating, somehow the models are all um, being damped in terms of their ENSO attitude, which is quite interesting. And if we just look at the spatial patterns, um, we can sort of see confirmation of the typical warm anomaly during ENSO is really damped in that last interglacial case and a little bit also in the mid Holocene, uh, sort of just damped at the western edge in the last glacial maximum, which is something I need to understand a little bit better. Uh, and then in our future runs, it's amplified a little bit. So there seems to be some evidence of, of strengthening in the, in the average but not necessarily in every model. And just looking at kind of the teleconnections or the, the long, uh, the large scale responses of rainfall to that, we see um, a dampening of the rainfall responses in the last interglacial and also in the mid Holocene. So less, um, less rainfall change for ENSO in those, in those climates where, where ENSO is weaker, which is what our proxy records would be picking up if they're sensitive to rainfall and um, an amplification of the changes in our future warmer climate, which is consistent with work, which has shown that, um, you know, in the future, the droughts will be drier and, and the, the floods will be uh, more intense, just associated with ENSO. Scott Power and, and colleagues, for example, at the Bureau have done some work on, on that. So we, we finally tried to kind of pull out any um, common relationships across all of those different simulations. And so I tried to sort of give them different symbols and you can see, um, we tried to see whether there was a relationship between the strength of ENSO or the change in the strength of ENSO and the change in the annual cycle of uh, temperatures at that same, in that same central Pacific box. Uh, but it's really very weak. There's a weak, uh, positive correlation here. And in terms of the zonal gradient from east to west across the Pacific, which you might think would have quite an impact on ENSO strength because it kind of drives the, the circulation, the walker circulation in the mean, uh, it turns out that 
that changes in that green have exactly no correlation across all of our experiments with changes in answer amplitude. So uh, it was frustrating, but we didn't really find any clear common relationship across all of those. And I guess it just shows us that different, um, different forcings are going to cause different responses in ENSO. So just to summarise, do the models um, simulate those, those known past changes? They do seem to capture the weakening in the mid-Holocene and the last interglacial that is suggested by the proxies, which, which is, gives us a little bit of extra confidence in our climate models. Um, in terms of those relationships, though, we really didn't find any um, beautiful relationship between ENSO changes and some property of the mean state, unfortunately. So we, we need to continue to, to try and explore that and see uh, whether we can kind of find some beautiful underlying relationship that may be there. All right, so let's move on to looking at a couple of other examples. Um, the monsoon is, I guess, something which is driven by the large scale um, seasonal uh, cycle of heating of land versus ocean, driving these strong gradients um, in terms of pressure and onshore uh, moisture transport in the summer monsoon season. And so it makes sense that if you go back into the past, if there's a big change in the strength of that seasonal heating, that you will see some kind of changes in the monsoon. Um, so we're going to look at, at that in the case of the Holocene. First, just to again come back to our future projections. Um, this is something that I've been kind of scratching my head about for quite a long time now, trying to understand uh, climate model projections for Northern Australia. So you can see here, the climate models agree on lots of things, but they do not agree on how Northern Australian rainfall is going to change as the climate warms. Um, the, the latest batch of models here and the, the most the second most recent ones all together, about half of them think it's going to get wetter in Northern Australia and about half of them think it's going to get drier. Uh, so it's not exactly helpful information to provide to um, you know, policymakers or, or planning um, communities in that in the region. So we want to understand better um, how sensitive the monsoon is to different kinds of changes. If we go back to... Um, paleoclimate evidence for the mid-Holocene. Um, there's, there's a few records that are relevant, but they're also, um, again, not sort of in complete agreement. So there's a spiliofen record from the Kimberley, for example, that shows um, strengthening from the early to the middle of the Holocene, um, but then relative to the present day, um, there's, there's a, a slight drying of the monsoon if you interpret that. Uh, Spiliofen isotopic record as monsoon rainfall. Um, there's records from up near Darwin, Cassie Rowe and others looking at um, lake sediment records from up near Darwin. And there's a, a few other records that people have tried to sort of argue the monsoon was dry or the monsoon was wetter at that time. Uh, but I don't think there's any consensus really from the paleo data community. Um, modeling studies have generally found a reduction in the monsoon rainfall and monsoon extent in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, looking at the mid-Holocene period. So when we look at our 16 climate models, and this does include access ESM now, I managed to um, process the model and, and include it in my, my results, um, we can see that there's actually a pretty good consensus about um, the response of the model in rainfall uh, in the summer season. So this is December, January, February, the peak of the monsoon um, changes at the mid-Holocene compared to the present day or the pre-industrial. And you can see that they're all showing basically dry conditions over land um, and the multi-model mean up here is a really strong dry and signal with some uh, weather conditions over the surrounding oceans. And it seems to be sort of a direct response to the strong cooling over land in that season, which is linked to this negative insulation anomaly at that time. So it's a reasonably straightforward story. If we look at September, October, November, which is the sort of pre-monsoon season at that time. Uh, we also see now an increase uh, in rainfall over Northern Australia, which is uh, associated with this warming over land, um, again, linked to the, the positive insulation anomaly at that time. And you can see, again, reasonably good um, agreement across all of the, the 16 models that we looked at for that uh, pre-monsoon season. And finally, looking at the other end, at the post-monsoon season now, 
we have again a stronger drying um, of North Australia and maritime continent associated with uh, the cooler conditions over land again. Um, pretty good model agreement across all of our models. And that's linked to that sort of end of that negative insulation anomaly in that season. So we've got this relatively greater cooling over land and over the surrounding oceans. And that seems to be uh, weakening our monsoon circulation and causing drying um, in, in that case again. So the question would be, uh, overall, was it wetter or dry in the mid-Holocene um, in, in the Australian monsoon region? And we would say based on the models that there is evidence it was drier. It's pretty good agreement um, in the peak monsoon season and also in the annual average for the dry conditions over northern Australia. Um, and there's been some work to try and decompose that as well into thermodynamic and dynamic components. So um, Roberta D'Agostino did this a couple of years ago now, and she showed that most of the change is actually in this dynamic part here. So um, remember, there's not a very large temperature change overall in the mid-Holocene. Thermo thermodynamic component is very small, but it's really this, this large change in the temperature gradient between land and ocean and the strength of that monsoon circulation that seems to be um, explaining most of that response. So I have looked at the last glacial maximum as well, uh, but I didn't want to present it here because it's a lot more messy. There's much, much less model agreement when we come to the last glacial maximum in terms of the monsoon change. But the mean Holocene, luckily, is a very nice, simple story. So um, the, the models show this strong drying signal in, in summer and across the, the annual average, and it's, it's driven by this land land area cooling with our reduced insulation at that time. And so it can be, um, to the first order, we can just explain it as that local response, local reduction in insulation, um, cooling over land, weaker monsoon. But also uh, we could think about sort of on a, a larger scale, there's a change in the interhemispheric temperature gradient as well, because there's um, cooler conditions uh, driving shift of the, the whole sort of tropical conversion zone and monsoon trough uh, in that season as well. So we can think about it on a local scale as well as on a larger scale. All right, so I just wanted to finish off with my third example, which is probably my favourite, and that's the South Pacific Convergence Zone. And that's this band of rainfall and convection and wind convergence that lies across the South Pacific and it moves around from year to year with ENSO. Uh, and its position seems to be quite related to the temperature gradients in the South Pacific um, it, that kind of de determine this, this transport of frontal systems into that region where they flare up into convective activity and then dissipate. Um, so there's a review paper that goes into a lot more of the details of the dynamics of the SPCZ, but we want to understand how it changes. In terms of the future, yet again, um, some models say that it's going to shift northwards, um, others say it's going to shift southwards, and some say it's not going to shift much. So we want to understand a little bit better the uncertainty in the SPCZ um, based on looking at past climates. Just wanted to very, very briefly mention a couple of projects I'm involved with, uh, which sort of relate to using or bringing together paleo records. Um, one of them is working with um, Dan Sinclair's group in New Zealand on a Marsden grant to try and look at uh, speleotherm records across the South Pacific, including from Niue, um, detailed records of SPCZ variability through the last glacial period. And that's working with a um, PhD student who's trying to run a model and look at how the SPCZ may have varied in response to um, the, the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation Change, and Dan Scott Eschke events in. Uh, the last place we period. Another one is um, looking at more recent, the late Holocene from a bunch of lake and swamp sediment cores across the South Pacific. And that's a project in collaboration with people in the UK mainly, for some reason they like to do field work in the Pacific, don't know why. Um, and so we're going to try and understand sort of shorter term variability in the SPCZ in comparison with some, some model runs that they're also doing. Um, but so looking at uh, just the, the last glacial maximum case here, I wanted to look at how the SPCZ is, is responding to the big changes in climate that we have in our models. 
So if we just look at the change in the average rainfall, um, again, in, in summer over that region, we can see that there's sort of an increase here and a drying to the south, which is in that SPCZ region. So it seems like there's a shift perhaps in the SPCZ on average in the models. Um, if we look at the temperature changes, it's cooling particularly to the south. If we sort of remove the average um, temperature change, we see this relative change is sort of warming to the north and cooling to the south. So that seems to be in some way driving the SPCZ response. Um, if we look at a bunch of climate models, and uh, these are the changes, but also in the background, the average position of the, the rainfall um, actually rejected this one because it doesn't really have a distinct SPCZ. But for the rest of them, we can just fit a line to the maximum rainfall across this span and calculate, obviously it's quite simplistic, but we can calculate um, an average slope and an average latitude of the SPCZ for each of those individual models. And so I then looked at how that, um, that changes through the, the, in the different runs from present or pre-industrial to LGM and how the change in SPCZ latitude and slope relates to changes in that, that gradient um, from east to west or from west to east. And there is actually quite a strong correlation in the models between the change in slope, um, sorry, the change in latitude and that zone gradient and also between the change in SPCZ slope and that again, um, that, that zonal east-west gradient. So I think that is probably quite a good starting point to actually try and understand the response in the models um, where the gradient's stronger, the SPCZ tends to sort of shift northward and have a reduced slope. I also looked at the meridional gradient, the northwest, north-south north gradient. And again, there's quite a strong relationship there in this case, um, the opposite direction with um, the SPCZ position. So I think it's really responding probably to both um, the, the zonal and the meridional uh, gradient changes. And just finally, sorry, and I'm running out of time, but um, we, we wanted to look at the, the time variation through the last glacial cycle. And so we made use of some runs that the Hadley Centre has very kindly put on a public um, database that you can access to go all the way from the last uh, interglacial through uh, to present day. They're not um, transient, they're sort of little time slices, but they're uh, things where it's at um, 4,000 years apart and then 2,000 and then 1,000 as you get close to the present day. And it's, it's actually quite a decent model, had CM3. So um, we can use it to just look at sort of the, the time evolution of these processes. And so I've just picked out a couple of time slices in uh, from that run. Um, you can see that the model has a decent looking SPCZ and it also shifts quite a lot um, in the different simulations, depending on the changes in forcing, things like the orbital changes and so on. And so again, trying to find some, some relationships here. Firstly, I was just looking at the average rainfall. So how intense is the SPCZ? Um, and it turns out that that's actually really correlated just with the global average temperature. And so it's really just responding through that 100,000 year cycle to the overall to global temperature, basically. There's a very strong positive correlation there. Warmer, well, relatively warm, um, there's more rainfall, relatively cool, there's less. Um, in terms of the position, we find a very, again, a very strong relationship between uh, the latitude and the slope of the SPCZ and that zonal FST gradient across the, the South Pacific. So really <laughs> almost entirely linear relationship for both the latitude and the slope with that gradient. So and this was, I wasn't expecting to see such a clear relationship, but in this particular model anyway, it seems like changing that gradient really explains almost all of the shift in the South Pacific conversion zones position. So... Um, we, do, we do see a sort of overall northeast shift in our last glacial maximum um, with, with that sort of relative warming to the north and relative cooling to the south. And overall, we find these nice consistent relationships. This is the one time where we were able to sort of pull out um, a consistent story with that, that zonal and meridional gradient and the overall intensity of the SPCZ following 
the temperature. And I guess if that did hold in the future with warming, we'd expect more rainfall overall, but also um, depending on whether that gradient you know, strengthens or weakens, that gives us some ability to see how we would expect the FPCZ to also move. Um, unfortunately, models have quite a lot of uncertainty in their SST, uh, future SST gradients. So maybe we're just shifting that can down the road to the SST pattern. All right, so just to finish up, um, where could we go from here with some of this kind of work? It would be lovely to be able to run our models in a transient way through the last racial cycle or even longer if we were able to get them running a bit faster or more efficiently. Um, it'd be really nice to be able to have some of the dynamic things like dynamic vegetation that could really match better um, the important processes in our part of the world. Um, if we want to run some of these experiments, we really need the dynamic ice sheets to really capture those feedbacks um, and, and potential tipping points. And a lot of internationally, a lot of work now is going on in this paleo data simulation where we actually bring the models and the paleo data together into a single um, kind of reconstruction, which has more information than either of those things separately. The limitations, computing resources, and having a flexible modeling framework where we can easily configure our model for these different past climates. It's not a trivial matter as David can testify to change the coastlines or the runoff or the ice sheets in the model. So it'd be really nice if it was easier to set up these kinds of experiments and run them um, because I think there's a lot we can learn from looking at past climates to understand um, our region. Even if it doesn't answer all questions, I think it can teach us a lot. So thanks very much. Thanks for a really great talk, Joe. Um, first for the audience questions. Yeah. I was just curious at the moment um, how you do model changes in vegetation regime. For instance, you know, the Amazon and the Sahara were very different. Mid Holocene Australia obviously was very different going back 60,000 years. So, is that something you hardwire in, in your boundary conditions or? Yeah, so I mean, it depends model to model, but in access at the moment, we are prescribing the vegetation. So we we make use of um, data sets of vegetation reconstructions to actually put that information into the model. Um, it, some modeling groups do have dynamic vegetation and which responds to the changing climate to kind of, you know, produce some plant functional types or biomes or whatever. But at the moment, um, the version that we're running doesn't actually have that capability. So that would be something that would be really nice if we could we could implement that. I mean, of course, it needs to be able to deal with um, you know the diverse vegetations in Australia and things like that. And, and completely different question: Do you just assume a mean change of about 120 meters, or do you calculate regionally variable sea level change? And also, 120 meters based on sea level data seems like an underestimate. It should be more like 130, 135. Yeah. Um, are those concerns? Or... Yeah, no, that's a really good point. So I think I just pulled out 120 because I think that's what was in the PMIT for experimental design. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I agree with you that there are reconstructions that suggest it maybe have been more like 130. Um, so I'm not, I wasn't personally involved in, in the discussion about PMIT 4. I don't know why they chose that value. In terms of the regional sea level, I think it comes into play because there's also a, a land reconstruction, basically like a coastline reconstruction. So I think that will have incorporated um, some of the regional information, but it's also quite imperfect as well, which is why I feel like um, David and, and Nikki and so on are trying to work on better better versions of those. Yeah, in the protocol, like last space where we kind of experiments, they, they actually just say, here's like two or three different ice sheet reconstructions and you can choose whichever you want. Mm -hmm. And you just have to specify in your experimental design which one you chose. So they they're not they don't resolve the debate around what should you know where exactly it should be. Okay. There, yeah. But there there are some hard sea level limitations that suggest that the sea level has to be more than 130 meters lower, and and further that it has to have dropped and then risen again, sort of sharply either side of 22,000 years ago. So. Um, uh, the Yuskadiyakiyama's work in the Great Barrier Reef, for instance, shows that there's a sharp drop and then a sharp rise that isn't included in a lot of ice models. So yeah. that may be a limitation if you've got a, a 
it, it, I realize there's a lot of complexity and there's not many global ice sheet reconstructions, um, but it is something that it, it does seem like a major source of uncertainty for um, climate models. Yeah, I mean, I think when it gets implemented in a model, there, there's probably, um, I don't know whether 120 versus 130 would make a huge amount of difference because of the course, relatively coarse resolution of the model. I mean, I've got the somewhere in here, I've got all the um, the landmarks for the last glacial maximum in the models, and they're actually quite, they're, they're pretty clunky looking how they represent subtle in the yeah. different models. And actually, um, it makes quite a big difference to how the the monsoon um, circulation changes, which is annoying. So I'm hoping that in the new found opinion, they might have at least the same landmark. That would be great. Yeah, um, Jeff, you were I was interested in your um, um, you know, saying look at the monsoon and how consistent the findings were across the models, um, and then comparing that to the work that you've done on you know, future pro projections. And I recall, I think, from that work that the way that the future projections were responding in terms of northern Australian rainfall related to the sea surface temperature pattern in the Pacific. Mm. Um, so I was just wondering, in those mid Holocene runs, is the sea surface temperature pattern consistent as well between all of those simulations? Um, does that seem that does not play into it in the same way? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it matters as much because I think the local forcing is so strong in the mid Holocene. So I think if we, we sort of hit it with a hammer of that sort of strong cool, cooling and, and heating, it, it responds like as we saw quite uniformly. Whereas um, maybe the future changes are a bit more subtle because you've got each model has a different spatial pattern of warming. Um, but there is, um, so yeah, more recent, like the, the latest version of the models seem to show more with CMIP6, more of a um, relationship to the interhemispheric temperature change, which um, is something that I guess does pop up with the mid Holocene. So perhaps we could have a look at that and see whether there's any relationship there. But yeah, I mean, I was surprised that the models had such strong agreement for the mid Holocene, because when you look at, um, you know, the different paleo records, like they're all over the place. Some of them are saying wetter, some of them are saying drier. And so, um, I guess if we believe the models anyway, um, some of those records may be not being interpreted in the right way. Is there a potential that there's a seasonality effect, like a seasonality bias in those different proxies? But... Yes, yeah, I think that's quite likely because if you look at um, September, October, November, it's substantially wetter. So if you had a proxy that's more sensitive to that um, versus, um, you know, the peak summer or post-monsoon season, then it'll be picking up a completely different change in hydrology. Yep, thank you. Thanks for that talk. It was great. Um, I'm interested in uh, one of the statements you made about the mid Holocene uh, ENSO variability. So you showed a graph up there where the model showed, say, 5% um, decrease in trend, sort of uniform decrease in trend. So all the proxies that you showed showed an 80% or 40% advantage. Can you comment on that? Rather large order of magnitude difference. <laughs> yes. Between two yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so sorry, I'm just getting stuck behind the Zoom controls here. Um, so I think that's something we've been scratching our head about for quite a long time because um, people have been running model simulations of the mid Holocene for like I don't know twenty five years or something, and we we can mostly get the models to show a weakening of ENSO, but it's only ever really modest, like 10% or something like that. Um, whereas so many of these paleo records are showing much, much larger weakening. And I mean, I think there's been quite a number of different explanations put forward. I don't really have like a single answer myself. Part of it might be that um, the, the paleo records are picking up, um, like they've got, a, combined sensitivity to temperature and rainfall and perhaps they're kind of picking up um, a stronger like amplified teleconnection signal um, more than just what we're looking at when we look at Nino 3.4 SST variants. Um, they're also sometimes sensitive to the Central Pacific versus the Eastern Pacific types of El Ninos and there may have been a shift in sort of the flavor of El Nino from one to the other over the Holocene. There's quite a lot of work on that and 
perhaps um, that may explain you know, why there's an apparently large change, whereas it's actually just this shift in flavour, which we wouldn't pick up just by looking at Nino 3.4. Uh, but yes, it's definitely something that needs further, further research. And also a question. Um, with the South Pacific convergence, uh, this is a, a region with some serious biases in terms of models, right? Uh, and I was wondering if there was a, a relationship between the model biases and how they behave with the LGM. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess um, we have a known kind of bias where the cold tongue extends too far to the west and um, the, the edge of the warm pool sort of gets shifted over and the SPCZ itself kind of becomes too zonal in its like classic kind of zonal SPCZ um, bias. And in models that have that kind of bias, they don't tend to basically respond as much to changes in um, the the equatorial or tropical region because they're, they're kind of fixed in place. So that's why I think the newer generation of models, which don't have such a large bias, are actually showing um, more. Or as it turns out, had CM3 as well. It does quite a nice job. But yeah, some of the older models, uh, the SPCZ just kind of sits there and you, you can't really get it to move because of that massive um, bias that they have. How does access ESM do in that region? Uh, it's not too bad. Too bad? Yeah. Yeah. Should do it. Yeah. So, um, We've got that, um, we've been doing some glacial runs, not not the last glacial maximum, but there's like 49,000 years ago. Um, we're looking at changes in the freshwater forcing, and I think this SPCZ is moving in those. So, yeah, study that further. Um, any, any more questions or? Yeah, no more? Okay, well, thanks, Joe, again. And...